The Inclusive Mosque Initiative was started by two queer Muslim women. Dervla wanted a space where she didn't have to separate from her son at the mosque, having to leave him alone and unsupervised in the men's section. Timsila had to experience her mother be denied a space to pray because in her final days of life, she had become a wheelchair user and was unable to get up the flight of stairs to the women's section. I grew up a fairly privileged brown Muslim woman in London and found that I could fit into most mosques and Muslim spaces. In fact, for me, Muslim spaces were safer spaces. In my post 9-11 world, they were free of the racism and stigma a young woman in a headscarf often experiences. But as I grew older, I started to see the oppressions within those spaces. The ideals I had about Islam elevating women that I had seen in the powerful women I grew up around and in the stories I had read was not what I was seeing in my experiences. At my London University, the Islamic Society held up levels of gender segregation that meant that even at annual general meetings, sisters were asked to sit at the back and told not to speak, but pass notes to the brothers in leadership at the front. At my local mosque, I was elected to the committee, the only woman elected to the mosque committee, but I was relegated to taking minutes and organizing women-only activities. In 2008, in my second year at university, Dr. Amina Wadud came to the UK to lead a mixed gender prayer. She's in the middle of this picture. I watched that prayer from afar, half horrified, half spellbound. You see, Muslim prayer or salah is really very simple. Anyone can lead a prayer. You just have to know how to pray. But the leadership of a Muslim woman of a mixed-gendered prayer is considered sacrilegious. Even though no specific rules deny her leadership, she has simply been written out of the practice, with words like modesty and decency used to keep it that way. Even though the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was known on to at least one occasion to have asked a woman to lead a mixed-gender prayer in her home. Witnessing that radical act threw me into deep introspection. I began to read the works of feminist Muslim writers, reading feminist readings of the Quran, commentaries on sexual ethics and Islamic law, reading the tales of their struggles. More and more, I began to see a disconnect in my ideals of justice, of God's justice, and the lived realities of the community I was living amongst. Dr. Amin Awadud formulated the Tawhidic model. Tawhid in Arabic means oneness. And so Tawhid is the idea that God is one. But unlike the patriarchal model, where God's authority is mediated via men, the Tawhidic model stipulates a God that is a single genderless deity, but with an undivided society underneath. The principle of Tawhid, then, safeguards against hegemony, oppression, and hierarchy, and creates a society where everyone is together and enables relations of social justice, harmony, and equality. So in 2010, when that radical act was repeated, when another Muslim woman came to the UK to lead a mixed-gender prayer, I was ready to pray behind her. I remember standing in the rows with other men and women behind this woman and crying and crying during that prayer. It was one of the most profound spiritual experiences of my life. This was a woman just like me, that I could speak to after the prayer, that I could hold, that I could acknowledge for leading me and others. my whole concept of what it was to be a Muslim woman shifted. 
It was one thing to read about the Tohidic model and learn about it in books, but it was quite another to experience it in the community practice. After that prayer, I felt at a complete loss with the existing spaces in my community. I didn't know how I was going to find that special connection to the divine again, how that female spiritual leadership was going to be established in a UK context. Lucky for me, a few years later, I met Tim Seeler and Dervla, who I talked about at the beginning. They shared with me their vision for the Inclusive Mosque Initiative, a space where Dervla wouldn't have to separate from her son to pray, where Tim Seeler's mother, if she was still alive today, could access the prayer space, where the spiritual leadership of Muslim women would be centered, where black and brown bodies would be safe, where visible and non-visible disabilities would never be a barrier to participation. So in 2012, the Inclusive Mosque Initiative was created. And that December, at our first prayer meeting, I got to lead the prayer. Our space has been in existence for five years now. And every year, more and more people come to join with us and to pray with us. But we don't just do prayer. We run workshops and discussions on mental health, racism, ableism. We talk about toxic masculinity, the space of ex-Muslims. We run soup kitchens, and musical events. And recently we started a support group for the family members of LGBTQI people. We cry, we exist, and we grow. As the chair of the Inclusive Mosque Initiative, I can tell you that in a space that is inclusive of all, there is great joy and healing. Just like the joy I felt in praying behind a woman and mom for the first time. Doing that alongside others you build relationships of trust and growth and friendship. You find the wholeness of yourself that you thought you lacked. But it's not without its difficulties. In a space that exists to overcome oppression and privilege, there are challenges to make sure that every voice is heard. So just like at home, when your mum tells you to get your act together, our space does that too. It lets you center yourself, but then question who you have marginalized in order to be centered. And so the leadership of Muslim women is important, but what of the leadership of black Muslim women who are often sidelined and their narratives marginalized in place of the normative Muslim who is Arab or South Asian like me? And so, because I don't just want to center myself, here are the stories of some of the people in the Inclusive Mosque Initiative or Imi. Layla says, I feel safe, seen, and accepted at any Imi space. As a Muslim bisexual woman, I have never found comfort within the walls of a traditional mosque. Imi made me realize that Islam is definitely not a monolith, and that I don't have to endure misogyny and queer phobia for the sake of spirituality. I get a sense of belonging and home at IMI. It is so wonderful to have a space where people can be who they are and where people can discuss issues without the feeling of being ashamed. I feel a sense of comfort with IMI that I do not feel in other spaces. The people there are great company, great friends, and non-judgmental towards others. Rather than having one imam with one perspective, Imi has given me a whole group of imams, all with different knowledge and experiential expertise. Imi has taught me more about diversity than any other training program or form of learning. I have increased my knowledge of what being inclusive really is, and this makes me feel closer to God than anything else. Nafisa. Our space exists against the backdrop 
of a broader socio-political context. No one can escape the fact that Muslims suffer increasingly from Islamophobia in Britain today. Research and statistics show that Muslim groups are one of the most marginalized and impoverished groups in this country. When the identity of Muslims is approached from a binary set up, there's a narrative that wishes to portray some Muslims as good Muslims and some Muslims as bad Muslims. That narrative only marginalizes the entire community even further. Our organization is often approached by media outlets who want to know about the work we do, but more specifically about the reactions of other Muslims, our Muslim oppressors, because it's only interesting and newsworthy when Muslims are the victims of other Muslims. You see, painting a picture of a misogynistic, patriarchal, homophobic, bad Muslims only feeds into the narrative of government policies like Prevent that, wish, that traumatizes entire groups of Muslim people. No media outlet is interested in the fact that our biggest challenge is finding accessible and cheap spaces in London where a Muslim group will even be allowed to pray. Or that most of the people in IMI are more concerned about right-wing fascism and racism. That my biggest fear is for my hijab-wearing mother that she comes home safely after she's been out and about in London. Muslims and Muslim women who choose not to pray in mixed-gendered congregations or pray behind women imams are not somehow in need of reform. The mosques and Muslim organizations that exist in this country that I talked about earlier have a story to tell too. They experience struggles and hardships, and I don't wish to stigmatize the work that they have done and are still doing. They are the spaces of our parents, our siblings, and our friends. Feminism exists in these spaces too. The Muslim community is full of strong, brilliant Muslim women. We see ourselves as part of the landscape of the UK mosque experience. Our space isn't a space where liberal values or Western values have won at the expense of Islamic or Muslim values. Our stories and narratives as Muslim people is one of struggle and resistance. We center ourselves first and foremost in the religion of Islam and the book of the Holy Quran. We're not ashamed of that fact. We don't need saving from anyone. And we're not your poster child for liberal, progressive British Islam. So when you hear the story of a space like ours, don't hold it up in contrast to all the other Muslim stories you've heard about. Reject that binary. Muslims come from every background, every class, racial identity, sect, sexual orientation, disability. They are at different levels of traditionalism and religious practice. We do good and bad and boring things, and we shouldn't have to always humanize ourselves. Thank you.